Hello and welcome to this edition of A Conversation With. I'm Jim Marshall from the New Bedford Cable Network and joining us in studio today for a return visit is Priscilla Madden. She's the superintendent of the Bristol County Mosquito Control Project. It's a long title right there, but she's back for uh, this year for another visit after last year. And you know, what a year last year for you. Absolutely. Um, and it was record breaking, it really was. Absolutely, it was the most activity we've seen in the state uh, and in areas where Tripoli had not been found previously. As we know, Tripoli is very active here in southeastern Massachusetts, but the whole activity that took place out in Franklin County, Worcester County, and out towards Middlesex was unprecedented. It was last everywhere. Year. It, it really was, was everywhere. everywhere. Yeah. Yes. So we're back to talk about, I know the mayor's office was uh, talking about obviously getting you on as well due to, I mean, they've started spraying now. Um, it seems earlier they started spraying too this year. I mean, they, uh, we got the press release like a month ago, I think, that they had already started it. So we, you know, I think the one thing that you pointed out last year, this is, a, this is cyclical. So this was last year was, I guess, year one of what should be a three year cycle. Yes, typically what we've seen over the last 50 or so years has been three year cycles. And every once in a while, um, it'll just be a blip, uh, but mostly yes, three year cycles. So last year was a very active year. So we predicted that this year too would be very active. And it, it's interesting too, because I, I remember talking to you last year, the year before, two years ago, wasn't a very active year. So no. it's just, no, uh, the year before in 2018, we only had one Tripoli e isolation and that was from Plymouth County, uh, very late in the season in late September, and then some activity out in Western Mass in October. But other than that, there was no real activity to speak of, uh, despite the fact that we are you know, continuing to trap and do surveillance in all of the 20 towns within Bristol County. So we were shocked when activity started so quickly in 2019, um, pretty early in the season, you know, mid-July, and uh, ramped up very, very quickly. I think that's what caught all of us was how quickly we had not only mammal biters and bird biters positive at the, almost the same time. So tell us a little bit, what's the cocktail that's needed for an active season? How, what's, what's the environment like? So what we need to have is really good overwintering conditions for the mosquito that's responsible for the amplification or the buildup of Tripoli within the bird population. And they overwinter in our cedar swamps and our red maple swamps. So we need good rain um, in the months of June, July, August, and September as they go into the winter. And this year in um, I should say last year in 2019 heading into this year, we were down 10 inches compared to 2018. So we had much less rain as we went into the winter season or the overwintering season. So that was something that was sort of very interesting to us as we prepared for what we figured to be year two of this cycle. Mm -hmm. uh, we also need to have um, good populations of that mosquito that it's called Culocida melanora. It's the Tripoli amplification mosquito and we needed to have relatively robust populations in June in order to get the cycle going. We didn't see that this year in 2020. We certainly saw it in 2019 with populations above anything we've seen right. before. So that was something that was really interesting to us is that we didn't see that population. So that was great. And then the third factor is activity the year before. So those are the things that we look at in order to determine what we think the following season might bring. And it's interesting too, I, I was mentioned to you off, off air, you, you read the paper and in the paper they have the uh, rainfall, whatever total for the year, and it does show. It's been consistent all year. It's the the the, uh, the city has been down. I think they take the readings from the airport like ten inches all year, and there there was no snow either, and that's got to be a factor too that there's no precipitation. Absolutely, all of those play a factor. Um, sometimes snow can be insulating in some of our swamps for that overwintering mosquito, uh, and then sometimes it can just add to the overall water levels come this spring when everything melts, and certainly the water was down. We were conducting some experiments this year to see how the water levels were um, and different ways that we could possibly control the Culocida melanora larvae, which is very, very difficult to control. 
and uh, it dried down very quickly once the trees started leafing out um, in May. And we had very low water levels throughout a lot of our swamps throughout Bristol and Plymouth counties. We should mention too that Tripoli has been reported here in southeastern Massachusetts. We had the first case in mid-July. Uh, West Nile virus not reported down here, but in Massachusetts. So the disease, the diseases are still, they're still around. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's the importance of surveillance, of course, is for us to figure this out. And when we saw the first isolation, which was out in Western Mass for Tripoli in mosquitoes, it wasn't a human biting mosquito and it was around July 1st, which is very, very early. And now the second isolation came out of Carver uh, in Plymouth County not that long ago. So it, it also in a mammal biter. So it was very concerning that this could be the start of another very active Tripoli year. You're taking tests though regularly right now. What do you, do you have just a general uh, feeling of what you're seeing right now? What we're seeing right now is uh, a fair amount of mammal biters. Uh, our most prevalent um, mosquito that transmits Tripoli to humans is called the cattail mosquito. And we are seeing their populations are up. Uh, they live in cattails over winter, similar to the mosquito uh, that's important for Tripoli uh, in the amplification of it and uh, they tend to peak around the 4th of July and we definitely have seen that peak. Uh, so we're interested in how active they are this year. They tend to live very long, which is also concerning. This mosquito will last from about the 4th of July all the way to Labor Day, and mm -hmm. that's why it's very concerning for Tripoli uh, transmission. In, in the diseases themselves, or the mosquitoes themselves, I mean, it, it's still, I mean, because we had sports, I remember in high school last year, um, and I was just thinking of like the soccer and the football and stuff. I mean, it went right through October till you had the hard freeze. So, I mean, mosquito season, mm -hmm. if you will, you're saying it's from basically June till really that first hard frost. Absolutely. And unfortunately for Tripoli e or West Nile virus human activity, we tend to see that much later in the season than June and July. Okay. So the majority of the human cases for Tripoli e will peak around August and then uh, West Nile virus cases can go all the way into September. So really when we think of the unofficial end of summer, you know, when we get to Labor Day, the back to school time and we think Whew, we can put mosquitoes beside uh, actually that's when mosquitoes tend to be most active with disease risk and just for clarification for the folks at home who may not know the difference between West Nile virus and Tripoli e, Eastern equine encephalitis what, what are the differences there sure so they sometimes present the similarly uh, they're both encephalitis so they can give you fatigue stiff neck, um, you know, you're not going to feel so well, disorientation sometimes. For West Nile virus though, it tends to be asymptomatic in most healthy people. And of the 1% that do uh, contract triple, uh, West Nile virus and do get ill, uh, sometimes it can be severe and unfortunately it can cause death. But for the majority of the people, it's asymptomatic and you might not even know that you're sick or you might just have what you consider to be the summer flu. Unfortunately, Tripoli e is much more aggressive and in Easter, uh, southeastern Massachusetts, uh, there's about a third of the people that contract Tripoli e will pass away from it or will have severe neurological issues. So it's very um, different in the terms of way it presents uh, within the human body, but uh, the symptoms are usually very similar. Is it the same mosquitoes that carry the viruses? No, actually, so in Massachusetts, we actually have 53 different species of mosquitoes. Wow. Right, so of importance for Tripoli e and West Nile virus, there's about 13 that we really need to pay attention to. And they are not the same mosquito species. So for West Nile virus, we're looking more for container breeders, those that live right in our backyard, things that come out of catch basins or our plastic trash or our gutters and places like that. That's where you're gonna find the mosquito that's most likely to transmit West Nile virus. They actually use different birds as well. So the same birds that are involved in the Tripoli e cycle are not involved in the West Nile virus cycle. Mm -hmm. And for Tripoli, e, we're more concerned about hardwood swamps, the cedar swamp areas for Tripoli, e, as well as cattail mosquitoes, which are an important vector for Tripoli e to humans. It's interesting that you say that because now that I'm thinking, like the cases last year, as I recall, the people who contracted Tripoli, e, they were in suburban areas and small smaller communities it's it's not as though they're in new bedford per se 
And I don't know if that's a correlation, but it, it seemed that way. Right, so it's very hard sometimes to pinpoint exactly where somebody may get infected. So it's important to always take precautions no matter where you are. Uh, so you really have to decide, uh, you know, um, where are you, where are you spending your time, especially outdoors. It's very difficult for us to remember back, you know, especially now in the age of COVID where we have to remember who we right. saw two weeks ago. It's very similar to sometimes when you get infected by a mosquito bite. Where were you? Where did you spend time outdoors? Uh, but Tripoli was so active last year that really no place, right. you know, in the state uh, didn't have activity or a risk. Well, I'm just thinking in the city too is especially, well, I guess the north end is different because it's more rural. But as you look at downtown and sort of here in the south end and, and what have you, there's not so many swamps or anything like that, but you do have the, the bird feeders and the gutters and, and the, the wet catch base. And so it's, it's sort of a different. It is, absolutely. Mosquitoes can fly for miles too. So we do have to be careful about that. But certainly the habitat is different. So if we were going to be looking for something like West Nile, certainly the South End or you know downtown is more likely to be an area. Whereas the North End, uh, especially where you abut uh, Plymouth County and Freetown, there are a lot of swamps up there um, that can play a risk. But right. we just need to be careful no matter where we are. We are talking to Priscilla Matt and she's the superintendent of the Bristol County Mosquito Control Project. She is with us again this year to talk about the threat of Triple E and West Nile virus. And you brought up COVID, which I'm kind of curious, how was that, how was the pandemic affected in a sense what you do and what people are hearing or understanding? I mean, last year it was front page in the news and front and center and in news and TV and radio. And this year it's a, it's a totally different ball game for you. Absolutely. So besides changes, of course, that had to happen at our office for socially distancing and wearing masks and, uh, you know, more cleaning and everything, uh, certainly it's not top of the news. Um, so I appreciate the opportunity to come out and speak to the residents. Uh, I appreciate the city of New Bedford, the mayor's office and the health department for all that they do to get the information out there through press releases and conversations that we have. But no, unfortunately, it is not um, pressing right now, which is why it's important to get it out there that we are in that time, especially since most people have uh, taken to being outdoors more often, right? We've seen our city parks and everything, beaches be much more populated this year than they maybe had been in the past because people need to use their outdoor space. And some of it means right in their backyard where they might have standing water that they're breeding their own mosquitoes and they might not even know it. Well, I was going to say, too, that's one of the things that the health people have been saying is get outside. And I mean, I think most people are doing the social distancing thing, at least here. It seems to be working. Um, I, th I know the city's been very aggressive promoting that, but people are still out. And I think more people are out than probably before because, you know, they've been cooped up for a long time. So Absolutely. The so the threat is. It may be more prevalent because people are more active. Absolutely, and that's true. We can see that through the years. Uh, in really rainy summers, we'll get a lot less requests for people to spray for mosquitoes, and that just has to do with you being outdoors. I'm sure you've seen this past heat wave, people did not spend as much time outdoors because mm -hmm. it was just too hot. So we'll see that in the calls that we get and the questions that we receive. Uh, the more time people stay outside, the more um, people are interested in what the mosquitoes are doing or you know what are the mosquito populations. But like you said, it's almost been a little lucky too, the environment that we're in right now has been conducive to a less, up till this point, active year for mosquitoes. So it's a less active year for Triple E, but can be a more active year for West Nile virus. Really? Right, so what are we doing, right? We have no rain, so we're collecting water. We maybe have our rain barrels, maybe we have a bucket underneath our air conditioning collecting water, maybe we fill our, um, you know, our water pots or our buckets one time, a year, uh, one time a week so we can water our garden. We tend to bring those areas of uh, standing water very close to our property. So that tends to bring in the mosquitoes mm. very close to our property. It also can bring in the birds, right? When there's not a lot of water, people like to feed the birds. They like to have, uh, you know, bird baths and everything. All of those are great places for mosquitoes to lay their eggs. And then you get the birds that could be positive with West Nile virus together with the mosquitoes that we 
we need and you can get activity pretty quickly. So hot, dry summers tend to speak more towards an active West Nile virus year. Wow. And it's obviously that's something everywhere. I mean, you don't have to worry about the swamps. I mean, that's like we just said, right in South End for crying out loud. Absolutely. And uh, we'd be surprised, right? You can walk around your house. Maybe you have a tarp that you have over your wood pile that has a little bit of a depression that's caught some of this rain that we've had. Um, maybe you do have flower uh, pots out there or buckets that you're using to water your garden. You just have to make sure you're moving that water through every three to five days to help reduce the mosquitoes. What are some of the things that um, we, we should probably talk prevention a little bit too and you know, you've brought the samples in here to talk about uh, to show people what the larvae look like mm -hmm. and um, and I know it's, it sounds like a broken record, but really the, the, the way to combat this is nothing new. Correct, right. Uh, avoidance, avoidance, avoidance is really the way to do it. And uh, avoid activity between dusk and dawn when mosquitoes are most active, if you can. Uh, very difficult because, you know, it's very hot during the day. Uh, try to dress appropriately if you can, long sleeves, long pants. Again, very difficult when it's hot. So use a repellent, an EPA approved repellent. So DEET is one of the more common ones, but there's picaridin, there's oil of lemon eucalyptus. There are different options out there. You wanna read the label and reapply as necessary because that's one of the important things. And if you're going out and say you're camping and you're using your sunscreen and your repellent, you're gonna wanna make sure you figure out which uh, you're going to use first, which is your sunscreen, and then apply your repellent afterwards. And you need to reapply both, depending on your activities and how long you're gonna stay outside. I actually didn't know that there was a way that you had to put it on. There is, <laughs> there is, yep, yep. Um, I just wanna make sure too, that some people might think that, and I asked you off camera, so the heat and the humidity doesn't really deter the disease from, from occurring. I mean, it can, limit it but it's still there it's still there yes no unfortunately the heat may dry out some mosquitoes if they came out during the day but most of them are going to stay in the shade or um you know in more humid areas yeah. they're going to hang out all day long uh, in culverts and wood piles in in um you know areas where we might not be spending too much time but once it gets towards dusk they'll start to come out they'll visit you on your porch or in your backyard right. as you're just sitting there. And I was just thinking maybe, you know, and I never really thought about it. Well, maybe the heat, especially when you're talking about a heat wave, maybe it dries them up, but I guess that's not really the case. It can, it certainly okay. can. Um, just they're, you know, smarter than that and can find some areas where they're gonna hang out and hide uh, during the day. So you're probably not gonna be bothered by them if you're sitting in the sun. When you're talking about the DEET, I was, uh, something just popped in my head. Do you get people who say, oh, I'm worried about chemicals or whatever? Is there an old, a natural thing to, to use that prevents mosquito bites? Sure, and uh, DEET is probably one of the most uh, tested and studied of the chemicals that we use on our skin. It's been around for so long. So certainly we get questions and concerns. Sometimes it's not just about the chemical, but the feel of it. They've made a lot of new types, you know, dry, soft, you know, less oily. Um, oil of lemon eucalyptus is one of the new products that's out there that's more of a natural product. However, it does have some restrictions for not to be used on children under two. So we want to make sure that we're using the products that are best for us. If chemicals are a concern, you can certainly use clothes that already has chemicals impregnated in them, such as permethrin, so more of your hunting clothes. Um, you can find those at your sporting goods stores where the chemicals are already in the clothes and maybe that's what you wear when you take the dog for a walk or you're gardening or you're outside at those particular times, then the, it's not directly on your skin. And then if you don't want to, then you know try using something like long sleeves and long pants, loose fitting clothes that can be light in color so that you know, you're not getting too hot, but can also reduce the, the mosquito's ability to bite. You touched upon kids and I know that's a huge, trying to get kids to do that and, and parents are worried about it but it's something that's got to be done too. And I mean, you mentioned the two-year-olds. I mean, the younger the kid gets it, you're probably more afraid of putting something on that you just don't know. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, if they're really small, try using, um, you know, a screen over, if you're walking them in a carrier, you know, try putting a screen over them. Things like if you're just hanging out outdoors, maybe in your backyard, use a fan. Um, the wind from the fan can help 
you know, disorient the mosquito or make it a little bit more difficult for mm -hmm. them to fly. So it's something really easy you can put, you know, in your backyard or something. But yeah, you'll want to keep an eye on the kids because they're less likely to tell you you're getting they're getting bit by mosquitoes. Right. But if you're sitting outside and they're bothering you, they're certainly bothering the kids as well. Talk a little, you mentioned um, pets, and I'm curious as to, I mean, obviously we know that horses are, uh, can be impacted, and I've seen, f you know, farm animals, and I know, you know, people who might be watching in Freetown and Rochester and what have you, where the animals are pre prevalent. Uh, dogs and cats, can you talk a little bit about animals and how they're impacted and, and what we can do or should do for them? Sure, so there is a vaccine for horses for both West Nile and Tripoli, and I highly recommend that people speak with their vets about having them vaccinated. Uh, while dogs and cats um, have tested positive, you know, in studies for, for mm -hmm. these diseases, they don't seem to have any impact on them. Um, you'll want to check with your vet before you use any repellents. Um, DEET is not supposed to be used on pets, so I wouldn't suggest okay. spraying your dog down mm -hmm. with DEET before you go out. But there are products that, th that can be used that can help reduce um, mosquitoes and ticks and fleas on your pets. Remember also that uh, dogs get dog heartworm from mosquitoes as well. So you're going to want to reduce your dog getting bit by, yeah. Well, I was thinking too, I mean, again, you're looking at the different, the, the city's so diverse in its environment. I mean, the North End, you know, the dogs are running around in their yard and, and what have you. And I know obviously you have the, you know, for tick control and flea control, but there's nothing really in a sense mosquito control mm -hmm. per se it doesn't sound like it, at least right right mostly you're preventing the mosquito once it's come to feed on the dog versus uh anything else but yeah some of the products that they have they use for tick and flea control also does help kill mosquitoes if they actually land on the dog to take and take cats the, the same way um cats are a little bit different because they react a little bit different to some of the products so you'll want to check but uh most people um don't actually really treat their uh their their cats yeah. for mostly for fleas <laughs> well it's interesting that the horses though and i assume uh, farm animals like you were saying there's a vaccination for them mm -hmm. um, yes is that effective? Uh, do, you, do we find that it does work? Because it seems like you, you, when you when you hear the news stories, it's always a farm animal that gets it first. Absolutely. So if it's following the correct um, schedule for vaccinations through your vet, then yes, it's been very effective. Oh, it's Both a regular. Th correct. So right. it's not a one shot. It thing. is not a one shot okay. thing. No, there's usually one shot and then a booster within the same year. Oh, okay. So it's very important that we do that. We have certainly seen that vaccinations vaccinations work. So back in the 50s and the 70s when we had Tripoli outbreaks before the vaccine was was available, you would always see horse cases prior to human cases. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, we use them sort of as what we consider sentinels, right? Something that told us that there was activity out there. And we would see it first in mosquitoes, and then it would go over to horses and then it would go into humans um, because horse owners are vaccinating their animals so frequently we tend to see less animal activity and it doesn't come usually before human activity so we've lost that sort of key to figuring out how the virus is going or how active it might right. be which is great for the horses because nobody wants right. their horse to die but uh, we did lose sort of a little bit of information from um, how efficient how efficient the vaccine is got a few minutes left here and i just want to touch on some of the things that the uh, your organization is doing in a sense now uh, i know the new bedford and i just want to mention this too every thursday through late september new bedford is spraying right now ground spraying they're doing Buttonwood, Brooklawn, Hazelwood, Riverside Parks, Klasky Common, Ashley Park, Fort Tabor, the Poor Farm area, and downtown. Um, and they're working with you. Yes. Uh, doing that. So what are, the, are is spraying going on in a lot of places now for you folks? So we are spraying in all 20 towns within Bristol County, okay. Mass, for sure. And our, actually our calls are up this year, I think because like you mentioned, people are outside and using their property. So for the first six weeks of calls, so from uh, Memorial Day, sort of in, uh, you know, through the end of June, we've taken over 8,000 requests for spray. Um, which is above where we were last year, despite the activity mm -hmm. that we had last year. Right. And I think it's like you said, people are 
spending more time. Um, so we are spraying in all areas. We also come to the city and try on that Thursday to spray some of the residential requests that we have as well. But certainly people are using their par the parks more within the city um, and within all the towns that we have. Uh, so we're trying to keep an eye on the trap counts and making sure we're keeping our trap counts low. So we might be spraying in areas where um, our traps are located as well as the parks as well as residential requests. So if people do have residential requests, how can they get in touch with you? So they can call our office between 8 a.m. and 2 p.m. 508-823-5253. They can fax a request to 508-828-1868 or they can email us at requestbristolmcp at comcast.net. And all we need is your last name and your full address. How, how many times does that work? Um, is it a one-shot deal or is it something that people have to get kind of like a booster shot that you got to do it a couple times a year? Right. So it depends. We find that it's different depending on where you live. Maybe if you live in the south end, you might be bothered by salt marsh mosquitoes, uh, but only a couple of times per year. So you'll call in when you have that issue. Yeah. Um, maybe if you live closer to a lot of catch basins or standing water, you might need to call in more often. Um, so it really just depends on how, uh, how you feel your mosquitoes are at your property. So there's no limit as to there's how many no times limit. you can call. Correct. There's no limit, but we're only really in the city twice per week. Yep. So, uh, you know, you're probably no more than once per week throughout the summer. Um, we'll stop uh, once temperatures drop below about 58 degrees in the morning. We don't start before 58 degrees, but we stop when it gets below 58 degrees. And that's just simply mosquitoes are not flying when it's too cold outside. So the only way for our product to work is it has to come in direct contact with the adult mosquito in the environment so if they're not flying and they're hiding somewhere the product's not going to work so we only spray when it's above 58 degrees so the frost kills them but there's sounds like there's sort of a great uh, a window if you will of less activity yes absolutely so frost a hard frost is defined very specifically of uh, oh, uh, you know less than 32 for more than three hours for three days in a row right. or a hard frost is like below 28 for so many hours that really doesn't take place in in our area it's and October it, or November in some cases yeah. it can take quite a while um, so yes so you'll see a decrease in activity and you'll see an inab inability on our part for chemical control to work very well okay. so that's when uh, personal protection certainly takes up more uh, more time and more or less the mosquitoes are not necessarily dying or you know or dying off uh, they're just not going to reproduce again so the eggs are going to stay the uh, larvae are going to stay they're just not going to emerge and then we do have a few adults that actually overwinter um, as adults in in the area people looking for information what's uh, the website where can they go to uh, it's www.mass.gov slash e e a slash bristol county mosquito control and all the information that we've talked all about the information is there. there phone number email address if you want to exclude your property from being sprayed if you want to be an exclusion you don't want pesticides on your property you certainly can call us and make a request we'll pass it on to the state uh, and if you have any questions about the products we use or the products we talked about for uh, personal repellents, it's all on our website. Sounds good. It's good seeing you again. Thank you very much. Thanks for coming in. I appreciate the opportunity and I appreciate the city of New Bedford allowing me to uh, provide this information. That's going to do it for us. I'm Jim Marshall, Priscilla Matten from the Bristol County Mosquito Control Project. As I've been our guest, we thank you for watching and we'll talk to you again soon. <laughs>